Gobekli Tepe, who built it, when and why was it buried after its useful life? Homeric Origins Gobekli Tepe is a name familiar to anyone interested in ancient history and mysteries. Built as the oldest stone temple in the world, it is composed of a series of megalithic structures containing rings of beautifully carved T-shaped pillars. It sits on a mountain ridge in southeast Turkey, just 8 miles the ancient city of Offa, close to the traditional site of the Garden of Eden. For the past 10,000 years, its secrets have remained hidden beneath an artificial belly-shaped mound of earth some 330 by 220 yards in size. Agriculture and animal husbandry were barely known when Gobekli Tepe was built, and roaming the fertile landscape of Southwest Asia were primitive hunter-gatherers whose sole existence revolved around survival on a day-to-day -day basis. In this video, we will try to answer the various questions that have been left unanswered since its discovery. Who created Gobekli Tepe and why? And more importantly, why did it build as bury their creation at the end of its useful life? In attempt to answer these questions, we are inspired by the book entitled Gobekli Tepe, Genesis of the Gods. In this book, there are compelling evidence that the myth of the washers of the Book of Enoch and the Anunnaki of Mesopotamian myths and legends are memories of the Gobekli Tepe builders and their impact on the rise of civilization. It is also believed that the Gobekli Tepe was constructed by a hunter-gatherer population still in fear following a devastating cataclysm that nearly destroyed the world. A comet impact that science today recognizes as having taken place around 12,900 years ago, with terrifying aftershocks that lasted for several hundred years afterwards. Yet, it seems unlikely that those who came up with a plan to counter the innate fear of another cataclysm were the indigenous population. This appeared to have been orchestrated by members of an incoming culture, composed of groups of shamans, warriors, hunters, and stoned tool specialists of immense power and charisma. Their territories across which they traded different forms of flint as well as hematite used as red ochre stretched from the Carpathian mountains in the west to the Russian steppes and plain in the east. More incredibly, anatomical evidence points to them being of striking appearance, tall with extremely long heads, high cheekbones, long faces, large jaws, and strong brow ridge, which some have seen as evidence they were Neanderthal human hybrids. So, who were these people? The answer lies in the rise of the Swedarians, whose mining operations in Poland's Switoziski or the Holy Cross Mountains are among the earliest evidence of organized mining activity anywhere in the world. This advanced society would trip in both Central and Eastern Europe around the time of the comet impact event of 10,900 BC was responsible for the foundation of various important post swedarian cultures of the Mesolithic Age as far north as Norway, Finland and Sweden, and as far south as the Caucasus Mountains and as far east as the Upper Volga River of Central Russia. The Swedarians' highly advanced culture, which included a sophisticated stone tool technology, was derived from their distant ancestors. The Eastern Gravitian people that thrived between 30,000 and 19,000 BC in what is today the Czech Republic and further east on the Russian plain. In around 10,500 BC, it is believed that Swedarians' group moved south from the East European plain into Eastern Anatolia. Here, they gained control of the regional trade in the black volcanic glass known as obsidian at places like Bengal Mountains in the Armenian highlands and Nemrut Dag, an extinct volcano close to the shores of the Lake Van, Turkey's largest island sea. 
This brought them into contact with the communities who would later be responsible for the construction of Gobekli Tepe around 9500 to 9000 BC. Everything suggests the Swedirans possess a sophisticated cosmology gained in part from their cousins, the Solutrians of Central and Western Europe, who were themselves related to the Eastern Gravitian peoples. They believe in the cosmic tree supporting the sky world entered via the Great Rift, the fork or split in the Milky Way caused by the presence of stellar dust and debris corresponding to the position in the northern heaven occupied by the stars of Cygnus, the celestial swan also known as the Northern Cross. The Swedarians believed also that birds were symbols of astral flights and that this was the manner in which the shaman could reach the sky world. In Europe, the birds most commonly associated with these beliefs and practice was the swan, while in Southwest Asia it was the vulture a primary symbol of death and transformation in the early Neolithic age. Both birds are identified with the Cygnus constellation. Using these guys, the shaman could enter the sky world and counter the actions of the supernatural creature seen as responsible for the cataclysm like the comet impact of 10,900 BC. Referred to by scientists today as the Younger Dryer Boundary Events. This cosmic trickster was seen to take the form of a sky fox or sky wolf, embodied perhaps in the leaping foxes carved in relief on the inner faces of key pillars at Gobekli Tepe, and remembered also as the Fenris wolf responsible for causing Ragnarok, a major cataclysm preserved in Norse mythology. Also across Europe and into Southwest Asia, accounts exist of supernatural foxes and wolves that have attempted to endanger the sky pillar supporting this starry canopy, an act that if achieved would have brought about the destruction of the world. Someone realized that only by allaying people's fears regarding the immense potency of the cosmic trickster could stability be truly restored to the world. And whenever this supernatural creature returned to the heavens in the guise of a comet seen as a visible manifestation of the sky force or sky wolf, it would be the shaman's role to enter the sky world and counter its baleful influence, a primary motivation that is believed to be behind the construction of Gobekli Tepe. Yet, there were clearly other reasons for the construction of Gobekli Tepe. Each stone enclosure served most likely as warm chambers, places where the shaman entered into primal states after passing between the enclosure's twin central pillars. This enormous monolith, sometimes 18 feet in height and weighing as much as 16.5 tons a piece, acted as otherworldly portals to invisible rims. This could be considered true stargates in every sense of the world, and their targets, the setting down on the local horizon of Denim, Cygnus' brightest star, which marked the start of the Milky Way's Great Rift, a role played by Denim as early as 16,500 to 14,000 BC. At this time, Denim acted as pole star, the star closest to the central pole during any particular epoch. Even after Deneb ceased to be pole star around 14,000 BC due to the effect of procession, the slow wobbling of the Earth's axis across a circle of approximately 26,000 years, its place was taken by another signal star, Delta Cygni, which held the position until around 13,000 BC. After this time, the role of pole star went to Vega in the constellation of Lyra, the celestial lyre, when around 11,000 BC Vega moved out of range of the celestial pole, no bright star replaced it for several thousand years. This means that when Gobekli Tepe was constructed about 9,500 to 9,000 BC, there was no pole star. 
It was for this reason that Deneb and the Milky Way's Great Rift retained their significance as the main point of entry to the sky world, making it the primary destination of the shaman. Standing walls erected in the northwestern section of the walls in two key enclosures at Gobekli Tepe bore large holes that framed the settings of Deneb each night, highlighting the star's significance to the Gobekli builders and showing the precise direction in which the shaman should assess the sky world. Do they have cosmic knowledge? Everywhere you look at Gobekli Tepe, there is confirmation that it builders share a sense of connection with the cosmos. From the strange glyph and ideogram on the various stones, which include symbols resembling the letter C and H, to the twelve-fold divisions of stones in the various enclosures, there is powerful evidence that these 11,000-year-old temples resonate the influence of the celestial heavens. The Hesh glyphs seem to relate to the shaman's journey from this world to the other world, while the sea glyphs are almost certainly slim lunar crescents, signifying the transition from one lunar cycle to the next. Even the design of the enclosures appear to have cosmic significance. Invariably, the structures are ovoid in shape, with a length to breadth ratio of around 5 to 4 numbers that could hint at the Gobekli Builders' profound awareness of cosmic time circles, not usually thought to have been understood until the age of Plato. If Swedenborg groups were the shamanic elite responsible for Gobekli Tepe, then there is every chance that the cosmic knowledge encoded into its construction came at least in part from highly evolved individuals who were by nature neanderthal human hybrids of striking physical appearance. These people were most likely the product of interaction between the Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans at the dawn of the Upper Paleolithic Age, about 40,000 to 30,000 BC. This is a very exciting realization that tells us that we might well have underestimated the dynamic potency of hybridization in the formative years of human history. Over a period of around 1,500 years, 20 or more major enclosures were constructed within the gradually emerging occupational mound at Gobekli Tepe. Old enclosures were periodically deconsecrated and covered over, quite literally killed at the end of their useful lives. New structures were built to replace them, but as time went on, they became much smaller in construction until eventually the cell-like buildings were no larger than a family-sized jacuzzi with pillars to more than five feet. Somehow the world had changed and the impetus for creating gigantic stone temples with enormous twin monoliths at their center was no longer there. Sometime around 8000 BC, the last remaining enclosures were covered over with imported earth, stone clippings and refuse matter and the site abandoned to the elements. All that remained was an enormous belly-like mound that became an ideal expression of the fact that the stone enclosures had originally been seen, not just as star portals to another world, but also as a womb-like chambers where the souls of shaman, or indeed the spirit of the dead, could quite literally journey to the source of creation, which was located somewhere in the vicinity of Cygnus constellation. It was a concept dimly remembered in the name Gobekli Tepe, which in Turkish means Naval-like hill. The Serpent-Headed People Even after Gobekli Tepe was abandoned, its memory and those of the ruling elite behind its construction lingered on among the Halaf and Ubaid people who flourished during the later half of the Neolithic age about 6000 to 4100 BC. Like their predecessors, they gained control of the all-important obsidian trade at places such as Bengal Mountain and Nemrudak, close to Lake Van. 
these elites who would appear to have belonged to specific family groups artificially deformed their already elongated heads not only to denote their status in society but also quite possibly to mimic the perceived appearance of great ancestors seen to have possessed extremely long heads and faces. It is very possible that these great ancestors are perhaps represented by the snake or reptilian headed clay figurines found in several Ubed cemeteries. What in your view do you think was responsible for the building of Gobekli Tepe? Homeric Origins